Welcome to Writer's Blockbusters, the show where we treat the final edit of a movie like the script. I'm one of your hosts, Bob Rose, and with me is Jamie and Jimmy. And right now, Jamie is going to introduce himself after his Alexa tells him someone's at the door. Motion's at the door. I forgot to, it was a good reminder to unplug it. Hey, I'm Jamie Nash. I am a screenwriter. I wrote two Save the Cat books, the Save the Cat Beachy Workbook and Save the Cat Rights for TV. That's me. Okay, Jimmy. <laughs> I am Jimmy George. I am a screenwriter and script consultant. And uh, if we're still doing this, my Twitter handle is at Jimmy R. George. Oh, yeah. I'm at Thundergrunt Bob. I Twitter. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> are we doing that anymore? I, okay. I don't feel like I get any Twitter followers from this show. Like, I don't think Aww. that's a thing. Yeah, I, I it'll just, happen. It, it'll. You've definitely got a few. I don't, I don't feel like it organically grows from this show. I, I think, you know, our <laughs> our fans are threads people or something. <laughs> Well, we'll see you. My, my, my name is the same on Threads, so there check us go. out. Um, today, we're going to talk about the original Beetlejuice. Uh, before we get into our discussion topics, we're going to go around and just, I don't know, you guys can say anything personal, thoughts, your experience with the movie, whatever, and then we'll get into our writing topics. Let's start with Jimmy. Uh, okay, so upon rewatching this movie, I had thought that it wasn't that influential to me, but I see it's horror comedy uh influence on my work because i definitely saw this when i was a kid loved this when i when i was a kid i wanted to dress up like beetlejuice when i was a kid and wasn't allowed to do that not like my parents are like conservative or something but (laughs) it just didn't happen and uh i distinctly remember being like i want to be beetlejuice (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like we can't do that um but uh yeah. worked at like universal studios and been like a <laughs> yeah. <the> halloween guy <laughs> um but uh yeah i love the movie and uh after revisiting it as an adult i definitely see its influence on my personal work so jamie yeah you know what's weird when i turned this on the other night I don't think of this as an 80s movie. I don't know why. I think this uh, as a 90s movie, uh, even though it's 88. Um, It's just something weird about it. I always think this is a 90s movie. But obviously, Batman came out in 90, I think. so. 89. 89. 89. So that's even an 80s movie. Back Um, to back. Yeah. Yeah. I I don't know why. I I always think this is like the evolution beyond the 80s movie into the 90s. Like, you know, we're we're starting to get a little more postmodern and do some weird stuff. so when I wa- I don't really remember when I saw this. I, I'm sure I saw it on opening night. Um, I, I was a Pee Wee fan, so you know from that I probably knew Tim Burton. I was a movie fan. I you know I was a big Michael Keaton fan for that matter. So I'm sure I saw I'm sure I saw this on opening night, probably some Friday night at some security mall theater or something <laughs> like that. Um, but uh, that said, I don't I don't really have a recollection of seeing it on opening night. Um, much like Jimmy said, uh, though I actually know this had a big influence. I think I wanted to write this movie. Like as a screenwriter, these are, I mean, I said this before on like when we did Galaxy Quest and things like that. These are kind of the type of movies I really, 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 really wanted to write. And then when I showed up to write them in the 2000s, nobody was really interested too much. Um, especially like in 2005, 6, 10. 15 they just weren't interested and sort of why i ended up doing kid stuff because kid stuff i could do stuff like this i could do they would let me do now i can't tell you how many times i've pitched beetlejuice essentially for nickelodeon or some halloween something comedy blah 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 so that's where i'm at with it it's heavily influential for me um not a movie like that's probably in my top 10 or anything like that but the kind of movie i always wanted to write on spec and and this movie was certainly that cool um i feel like i I think out of the three of us i might be the big biggest beetlejuice fan um and i I think if you go back to certain episodes i've said this similar thing before is whenever they make a sequel a legacy sequel to a movie that 
I consider like we don't question it anymore. It's beyond question. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I hate people revisiting old movies and then talking about it. Like they revisit Ghostbusters. I'm like, you don't question Ghostbusters anymore. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. The ruling has been stated. <laughs> like it won. You've lost. It's over. That's kind of how I feel about Beetlejuice. That's how much I love it. Where I'm just uh, like, and it's not. There's no revisiting Beetlejuice for me. I've said this one of the same thing. I think I watch movies more than a lot of people, but like Beetlejuice is like at least twice a year for me. You know what I mean? Like background noise mostly, but like. I didn't I don't have to, everyone's like talking about the new movie and then they're like I just watched the original and all they say all this stuff and I'm like you didn't have it memorized like, <laughs> like you don't have Beetlejuice memorized I even questioned you two you're like you guys didn't have it memorized you couldn't do this without rewatching it that's insane to me like it's Beetlejuice I don't know this is nuts anyway but so there all that said that's I don't need to go into hyperbole anymore what I wanted to say is something new I learned about it for this podcast. I was reading about Beetlejuice and stuff, and the, I think it was Die Hard. How, how long ago did we do Die Hard? Like five, six years ago, right? And I, I did. Re- I know this is going to sound like an internet fan theory, and it, but it's. I don't think it is. I think it's actually woven into the movie, and it leads into as we get into our topics. But um, if you, we're going to talk about the original draft, right? But if you, I just want to talk about one thing in the original draft and how it was changed and something I've watched a billion times since I was a kid, never knew it had this meaning. So in the original draft, when, you know, they can't leave their house um, and they go, they go to this other place and the original things that was filmed is Alec Baldwin gets into this void that's filled with gears, roving gears and stuff. They're going to crush him. And I knew about that deleted scene and that's supposed to represent the chaos of being outside of time and space and like the gl- the clocks uh, gears of a clock and everything trying to kill him. And that was changed to a moon of Saturn <laughs> with sandworms on it. Right. <laughs> and I, for now as re- this movie, it's so chaotic and it's so odd. I just always assumed that that was just some random thing. Someone thought up. I don't know if you guys know where all this came from, but Tim Burton changed it. And the, the, the last two writers they switched it over and the reason was is um okay so saturn is covered in sand and the sand's supposed to represent the sands of time filling an hourglass <laughs> okay <laughs> and the worms are there to consume death okay fine um and in roman myth saturn is the ancient god of time <laughs> i I never even realized that That's connection awesome. of like, <laughs> wait a minute, I, like, I don't know. Like I was reading about it and I was like, wait, so that is, that actually has a point. <laughs> yeah. They met, it made, they, 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 they made it matter. <laughs> they made it matter way more than I ever thought. Yeah. And uh, also on a, a little sub thing I learned is um, Beetlejuice and Lydia, right? Beetlejuice wants to be in the world of living. Lydia wants to be in the world of dead in Greek myth. Hades and Persephone. Hades is the god of the underworld who wants to leave the underworld, so he kidnaps and marries Persephone, right? <laughs> Think about the movie, right? <laughs> and in most depiction of Hades, he is seen holding or accompanied by serpents or snakes. Mm, I love it. I love it, dude. Right? The Beetlejuice <laughs> turns into a snake, and also his pockets are filled with snakes. <laughs> I was like, was this all in there this whole time? <laughs> It seems like such a silly movie and there's like actual, you know, learned (laughs) shit in it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And the last thing I would say is that if you didn't know in the original script, there's some dark stuff in there, how he takes control of the the girl and everything. But um, in the myth of Hades, uh, Persephone is ravished by Hades using the guise of snakes. Right. And if you remember in the movie, what happens right after he turns into a snake? He randomly decides he gets he gets really horny and visits a broth. Yes. <laughs> like, just seeing all those parallels. I read about some some guy, you know, I was reading a, a whole write up about the meaning behind Beetlejuice. I was like, there can be nothing there. There's <laughs> nothing behind this. And then I read all that and I was like, that's pretty good <laughs> for a movie that I've watched a billion times. It's pretty good. It tracks but, it right. It kind of tracks. Right? It might be it might be nothing. It might be unintentional. But the sands of time thing and Saturn being the god of time. Come on. It works. <laughs> um, so with that said, Jamie, who wrote this shit? 
Yeah, this one had three writers, uh, Michael McDowell, Larry Wilson, and Warren Skarin is the guy's name. Uh, I I don't have the box or the poster. Did Larry Wilson just get a story by, I think, for some reason? I think... If, I, I think we, Michael McDowell got the story by, didn't he? I, I, he? It was originally written by him. I, he, he, I think right? it's Michael McDowell and Larry Wilson's story by, screenplay by Michael McDowell okay. and Warren Skarin. Um, and, which is weird to me. And the reason I bring this up is this is one of those weird things to me. And I'd have to do research. And a lot of times these story by things get thrown out there. It's my understanding that story by can only be given by the WGA. But if you read it, it says Larry Wilson agreed to take a story by. And that's not how it works usually. Um, an independent film that happens, and it kind of annoys me that that happens. I've had it happen kind of annoys me because in a real script you just get a screenplay you'd never get a story by just because somebody rewrote something or did something like that um so i don't know what the detail the deal is with that assuming this was wga and they were all in the wga and i have to assume that because i know michael mcdowell was at least writing tales from the dark side around this time which may i don't know maybe that was independent i don't i have no idea um, i think what i read was he was fully a horror, horror novelist and this was his first foray screenplay oh so that's what i read i could be wrong though so the only reason i don't know if that's true i, I okay. don't i don't know he wrote some tales from the dark sides okay that predated this and I, so well maybe i read that it was his first feature exactly that's what I was that might say. have been what i read he, he yeah. also wrote an amazing stories episode oh, and, and very cool and these these two guys uh larry larry and uh and michael uh they they wrote um an Alfred Hitchcock presents episode, I think, or something like that. Um, I I watched an interview before this on Film Courage for Larry Wilson, um, and so I got a lot of details from that, and it was really interesting. I, I found that. Uh, by the way, go check it out because it's pretty good. I think um, I've watched that, Jamie. It's good. Okay, <laughs> and it's uh because it kind of gives the backstory of how those two work together, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll be referencing it. Um, throughout this like it's kind of after i watched it, i was like oh there's a there's a lot of key points that i want to bring up here um but larry wilson apparently was a development exec and he kind of got sick of that for various reasons he was never it kind of sounded like he was never getting promoted like he was supposed to uh, uh, the one story he told was that um he, one of his jobs was to find the person to write the alien sequel and he kind of found james cameron even though he, he even said he said like if you were in his position and James Cameron's script came, only a fool would not hire him at the time. You know, <laughs> right. the Terminator script came in and he read it and he was like, we are, he said it wasn't like a big deal, but he was told he'd be promoted and good things would happen. And and those good things never materialized. He had a couple stories like that. So he set out and made a company with Michael McDowell and Larry Wilson. And Michael McDowell was like a real, like everyday kind of writer. And the way he describes him, he reminds reminds me a little bit of myself and Larry Wilson was a development exec and Michael McDowell said to him, he basically said one day, he said, look, man, if you're going to work with me, you can't wait for inspiration. You know, we're, we're just like punching a clock here. We show up, we do the work, we do it every day. We do it for a few hours. Then we go home. There's no waiting for inspiration. We got to do it every day. And that, that's kind of the way they worked. And um, they formed a company that with a third a producer, and one of their projects was Beetlejuice. And when it eventually sold to David Geffen, which is part of the story, then I guess Tim Burton kind of came in, put his magic in with Warren Skarin, who eventually went on to do Batman, right? Right. Um, so I think, and so to go into the original draft. I wrote draft, some notes about original draft too, but yeah. I'll see what you say first. Um, and by the way, just to get it out of the way, my favorite thing, the box office for this, I think was 80... <laughs> I think it was 85 million I read here on Box Office Mojo. It had 75 for worldwide, but I think it was 85 off of like $15 million budget or something. Like and that's that. the 80s. So it was the 80s. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah, the, up that. It yeah. was the number 10 movie behind my favorite His thing. List. Oh, yes. man. Yes. Well, here's the weird thing it, it was ahead of Willow. Uh, Willow was 12 at 57 million. That's all that Willow made, which I guess is kind of right because it, it well, well, it was, it was a, considered it was, a flop. It was considered a flop. A fish called Wanda was eleven, and then Beetlejuice was ten. 
but the movies here are very interesting in 88 it's um cocktail is <laughs> ahead of it at 78 um moonstruck at 80 right. million which i want to do on the show it's on my list okay but i have an interesting uh the first time i saw moonstruck was on a cruise ship <laughs> that's where i saw it I, uh, I i did a reading from moonstruck at a wedding oh okay <laughs> Well, all three of us that more reason go. to do it yeah yeah, yeah. um die hard at 83 million uh, it was number seven uh uh three men and a baby 90 million it's amazing how huge is three men and a baby <laughs> the- making me sad just like <laughs> yeah. you're saying comedy movies that were yeah. like top 10 now it's well like, yeah. <laughs> i'm about to really hit hit you with one that you're gonna yeah. love crocodile dundee 2 at 109 million the best crocodile dundee movie <laughs> number five I, I easily remember, i'm not even joking i remember being at a horror convention and bob finding a crocodile dundee poster jamie being so excited i still have that framed i, I remember it, when you bought I, it you were I, so excited yeah. about it I, I was very excited i was like that was like the highlight of the weekend um and i still remember it um at a horror con <laughs> at a horror con yeah in hunt valley i think um yeah. Uh, so big was number four at 114 million. Wow. Okay. Also on my list. Wow. On my 10. Holy yeah. shit. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, these are amazing. Cause they're all like, com- with the exception of cocktail and die hard, they're like all comedies. Um, good morning, Vietnam at okay. 122 at number three coming to America is number two at 128 million. And who framed Roger Rabbit at 156? Wow. That's a wild year of comedy, right? You no, know, I didn't realize Good Morning Vietnam was that huge. successful. It was Holy so shit. big. That movie was so wow. big. Yeah, at the that time. is huge. And and kind of shoots. So anyway, back to the Beetlejuice. I think Roger Rabbit might be on my list too. If I'm it's not on saying. one of our lists. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I'm surprised we haven't done that one yet. But yeah. um, so yeah, the original draft of Beetlejuice when Michael McDowell and Larry Wilson worked on it, uh, apparently, and I'm surprised there's not like a, if anybody out there has like a specific, like the making of that's really good spot to watch a video or something. I'd love to watch it because there's, there's an okay one on YouTube that kind okay. of covers everything. I, I couldn't find any really good information. Like I found it all a little scattered and usually like yeah, just yeah. in paragraphs here and there. Um, but apparently, and, and some people, it seemed like they were exaggerating a little bit. Like they said, Oh, the original was like the exorcist. It was a horror movie and it wasn't a comedy at all. Um, and I think there are drafts out there you can find. I don't think it was a horror movie, but I do think it was darker. It, it showed, from what I understand, some of the things that were different. There was a, there was, it, the car crash had like gory details. It, yep. it showed him drowning and stuff like that. Like it was played like horror. They, they also yeah. got apparently taunted by like a local biker gang right. or something. And That's then right. that, and that, the fear from that, made them crash into a giant violent bloody wow yeah. what a difference yeah. the dog for, for, from a dog <laughs> yeah um, and you don't even see anything they just the car just falls yeah. in the movie yeah Be- beetlejuice himself was like a winged demon like this kind of mm-hmm. monstrous thing he wasn't as funny or interesting um the the scene the the deo uh scene the possession scene it was a whole nother thing where like the carpet turned into vines and like dragged people down and stuff like that. Like it was a really horrific monstrous kind of scene. Um, and then the ending was very different as well. Like, like how it ended. And I saw a couple variations of the ending, but one of the endings that was very different is Lydia like dies in a fire and ends up a ghost with them. Oh, and they, well, you know, and it, it was, there, there was almost a question where somebody asked them, they said, is this the message you want to send to, teenage right, girls right. who feel alone like they should die and they'd be happier um and uh there was, also, so there was a lot of weird stuff like that <laughs> the big change i read though that might affect what you're saying is that yes. the original first draft lydia was actually not the lead it was your younger sister oh i i don't even know she, that I saw lydia that. was yeah her younger sister was the one who could see ghosts okay. it wasn't lydia but lydia was in it but she wasn't the one who could see ghosts yeah and um and yep. the other thing I read too was I didn't know was you know what the original director attached was? No, no, I didn't. Wes Craven. Wow. Whoa. Wes wow. Craven was the original attached director. Wow. Now, of course, I could be getting bad information, but I mean, I never knew that. I never heard that Wes Craven was attached. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I it's think he went back to Nightmare. Different. He chose he chose his franchise over starting a new one, I think. I, so in that Larry Wilson interview, he said because this was like one of his first scripts that he wrote 
and he he sent it out. He was a development exec, and he sent it to somebody, and they said, "Hey, we'd, I'd like to meet with you on Monday." And he showed up on Monday, and they had this meeting. And during the meeting, the guy said, "You don't want to go out with this weird script. It's going to ruin your career." He said, "Don't do it." He said, "What are you doing? This is too weird. This is too dark. Do something else." He said, "Don't go out with us." And and uh, apparently, Larry Wilson had sent it to. This the reason I was interested in Larry Wilson. Apparently. And I don't really remember this, I because I, I probably came up and he was doing this, but he was like a screenplay coach, guru, teacher guy. Like he did a lot of that stuff. Um, he has a. It's funny in all the places he has a link to a website, but it's dead now. It's not. It's not there anymore. Um, and he, so so he sent it to one of his students at USC, that was now a development exec at Geffen, and they read it and they loved it. And they, they were like, no, we, I'm going to recommend they buy this. So wow. that's, that's kind of what happened. It, it was kind of an easy that, sale in some ways. That wasn't the first draft, right? That was like a couple drafts down. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but I, oh, okay. I, I kind of got the impression that that was one of the early drafts, the weirder drafts. Cause I, I think really it was when, when Tim Burton and Warren Scarron came in that it became the more Tim Burtonized version of it, but I'm not positive about that. I'm kind of filling in some blanks here. So, so imagine if he had taken that advice and been like, okay, I'm not going to believe in my work. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. you know, I've never had anybody, thank God. I've never had anybody like sit me down and say, you really need to find another line of work or something like that. Cause well, well, I probably would at this point just blow them off and say too late, dude. Um, there probably was a time where I'd be like, man, they really felt like they needed to tell me that, you know, <laughs> I must really suck. You know, I'm, you know, uh, to I be fair, imagine. yeah, I can imagine reading this. Like, in it's one of those 80s. things where, where, like, you need in... somebody to truly believe in it yeah. for it to exist. Mm -hmm. Because I could see it being on paper, even the draft that we're talking about, and the, you know, the fi final draft. I could see reading it on paper and being like, "What?" <laughs> you know, like, well, you, even this, Michael this work. had to be convinced, by right? Tim yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I could see it being on paper, just not convincing whatsoever. And, and keep know. in mind, this was 1988 when we hadn't seen lots of weird genre yes. bending. Right, right, right. You know, there, yeah. Tim Burton didn't exist back then. So he kind of ushered in a whole genre in, in some weird ways. Um, and that flavor. Yeah, it started with this movie. And this is one of those movies it. where introducing people to it is interesting. <laughs> because it's shocking how weird it is you know like <laughs> yeah. I, it's not weird to me anymore because i've seen it too much I, but I, I don't think it's weird anymore like i but i think back yeah. then no, it's pretty no, weird then, i yeah. and i don't even mean it's not weird because we all know it and it's been a hit and stuff i just did, i think they make things like this now yeah and yeah. some of it came after like the adams family or something like that or you in know the age and, of the internet weird yeah. doesn't mean anything anymore but, I, I say the Adams family came after this, but of course the Adams family had been around years before this. But um, so I guess you know. I know what you mean. The yeah. you know, um, commercial, the Barry yeah. Sonnenfeld Adams yes. family films. I, I was thinking yes. more like Wednesday on Netflix. Like maybe somebody out there is like I. in the comments, like Jamie, what is your problem? Yeah, I trust me. <laughs> I I watched the Adams family as a kid. I sang the song. I, I was I was part of the cult. I, I watched the monsters all the time, but uh, you know it still it's it's definitely it was definitely an odd you know i could see a studio exec in the 80s checking this out and being like this is this is kind of weird the, the, the 80s had so many movies that there were there were enough movies that came out that it felt like they could take a chance on like one weird movie where right. it feels less like that i mean they i guess they do on netflix and stuff like that there are some it's, weird stuff but it's just it's different. a weird pitch i almost there's part of me that's like it's like got a hitchhiker's guide-esque-ness to it about the afterlife it's weird that you watch a movie that's not like playing off you know the cartoon version of popular religions this doesn't feel like it's coming <laughs> from a religious yeah. place at all it's like what if we just start from the afterlife as you know from from the mind of tim burton or something it's it's not coming from like i was raised catholic so here's what this is you can't draw from you, things yeah that, you're not drawing yeah. from you're just drawing from like death weirdness and yeah. weirdness <laughs> and bureaucracy the afterlife is this nightmare of a bureaucratic hellhole like you know it doesn't it just doesn't feel like it's playing off it feels like it's coming from the place where hitchhiker's guide would like so, and nothing is miraculous it's all kind of the same just <laughs> with and, a different paint and the, the yeah. cap to cap this off one other weird thing since we're talking about death uh two of the writers larry is still alive but the other two died in their 40s um 
Oh, so one one was I, I think it was Warren was forty nine and Michael might have been forty four or vice versa. Um, so you know, because I, I was looking up the other things they did and they did things like the Adams Family, Na- uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, and you know other things like that. Batman, of course. Um, but then it kind of abruptly ended, and I was curious. But that that is what kind of happened with, with mm. both of them. They both passed early in the nineties. We're still talking about them. Yeah, still talking about them. Still talking about them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that was a perfect lead. In, not the death part. The other stuff is <laughs> a perfect yeah. lead into genre busting. <laughs> so I put this on here because Jamie has a tip that I think is very simple. Um, and it explains to me at a high level why this movie feels so unique. And that is if you're looking to make a genre movie and put a fresh spin on it, the first thing to think about is like, how can I change the point of view of the characters to give us a fresh take? So in this case, I don't know like if there were stories like in novels that did this before, but certainly I don't know of any other movies where it's a haunted house story from the perspective of the ghosts whose home is being invaded. That's the, that's the point of view shift. All the haunted house movies that came before you're focusing on the people who live in the house instead of the ghosts here, they flip the script and that, opens the door for everything that's fresh and unique about this it's right. the wicked of haunted houses well, exactly. <laughs> yeah pretty much I, I w- it's funny that you say that i was going to say the first time i kind of became aware of this was wicked like as a kid growing sure. up the, the novel uh and the novel okay. and i was We're making a movie we could do the movie <laughs> yeah and and wicked wicked kind of blew my my mind with it because it was like oh okay now we're doing it from the point of view of the, of yeah. the villains um also what, cobra kai a little bit Oh, there's so many, right? Yeah, like that yeah, was our I'm, our episode where we talk about this too, right? Exactly, we did talk about this. Right, I think you're yeah. right. That's where no. where Jamie first mentioned it. No, yeah, no, yeah. Wicked, Wicked came out after this, so it wasn't like, but it was. I don't know for sure. whatever reason that was the one that opened my mind to doing it all the time. Like, yeah. it, you Wicked know, is I, the Beetlejuice. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Of <laughs> Wizard of Oz. That's oh, right. you know, I made a list, Jamie. I, 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 this is, this exercise is, works so well. Here's like just very quick, easy to understand examples. Zombie movie. Normally we're following the survivors, the people who are escaping the zombies. Warm bodies is like, what if the fresh perspective was a zombie who's self-aware and understands that they're a zombie? Bam. And the whole movie is an exploration of that through that fresh point of view. Cabin in the woods. We're usually following monster victims. In this case, we're following the behind the scenes operators <laughs> orchestrating the horror from mm-hmm. their desks. Um, uh, vampire movie. What we do in the shadows is a great example of this. Like their fresh pers- perspective is like their mundane roommates, you know, just trying to like coexist uh slasher movie beyond the mask Les- rise of leslie Ver- vernon sh- follows like someone who's an aspiring slasher killer um and the final girls uh is follows a perspective of characters who like they don't even know they're in a slasher movie so it's also, just such an easy you said zombie my boyfriend's back a movie i love that's oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> it's a teenage probably kid. that same very close proximity to this when this came out right seriously and that's a good point yeah and then modern day i mean even things like i don't know maleficent or something or you know, twilight now, it's Cruella. every genre yeah yeah Cruella. monsters i remember um, i was at i was at like a comic-con and the cast of monster squad was there and the dad from monster squad said his sadness about modern pop culture was the monsters are the stars now it made him sad. That's he. He was sad because he was talking about like he, how much he loves Monster Squad, and he's like, "But now the main characters are the monsters. Yeah. We we've sw- the culture is completely switched. We're yeah. all worshiping the monsters. It's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I I did this. You know, I can think of. I'm sure I've done this like 10, 20 times over sure. time. Um, I probed uh, altered was this basically it was that was your big breakout, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and that was that was kind of where rednecks abduct an alien was kind of the pitch so I yes, reversed dude. The and then Such um and then <laughs> i mean you could say jamie like the movie we worked on together is literally from the pov that's right the it's, yeah I, I used to do this yeah, all too. the time like i'd spend all the time i one of my favorite scripts i wrote with a with a friend of mine aaron was um it was basically predator but tarzan 
is the monster he's the predator right so right they, they wow. kill they basically uh an, an exploration party like kills this b- big ape and it's it's tarzan's mom you know so he goes uh, revenge it's a slasher movie but it's tarzan um see? but Man. i i've done this so many times i think it's we had i am legendist right yeah yeah it, right like it, it turns out he's yeah. the he's the monster right? I, I i've had so many of these that i've i've done it's always fun to kind of kind of flip you know this so if you're yeah i'll do a couple more examples and then we can move on like shrek fairy tale instead of the pr- prince or the princess we're following the ogre mm-hmm. um uh hotel transylvania instead of humans encountering monsters it's monsters dealing with human intrusion mm-hmm. um sports uh money ball instead of following players or coaches we're following the general manager who's using statistics to yeah. win um like that's that's a very unique fresh <laughs> point of view that you wouldn't think would work but does uh even franchises do this um oceans for instance the oceans franchise oceans eight instead of ma- male thieves it's women thieves it's even just as simple as that so right yeah Monsters just, I, mean, I could think you know Monsters yeah Inc. oh my god has but anyone yeah, made a dolls from the point of the shark? Has that happened yet? <laughs> Whoa. Probably. What that what would that even be like? Man. I don't know. Jamie, write it. <laughs> yeah. It would probably be animated. But oh. <laughs> I, I think it's a great exercise and you're starting out and you're trying to figure out like, okay, I wanna I wanna make a I wanna make a vampire movie. Like, what's the fresh perspective that we haven't seen? The character perspective. And that's usually gonna open you up for everything that'll make it unique. So Ro- Robocop is Frankenstein from the point of the monster. Yes, that's Ooh. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even even moving to like side characters, like you you said, like not just the villain. It could be like, well, this is a villain, but like Renfield or something mm-hmm. like that. You know, just the other the other guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. The other, <laughs> the other guys. guys right. It's an exercise in this. Yep. Uh, even I would even say uh, Napoleon Dynamite is a, is a what if a teen movie was about the characters you that's, see walking in the hall and not about the hot. Popular. That's a perfect example. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, tone. Tone discussion. Yeah. So, you know, usually when I break this discussion, I'll do the tone meter and stuff like that. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something a little different this time. And this is a movie, again, that I tried to write all throughout my career and one of the hardest things about this movie is selling a movie with this tone it's very difficult because people people want it to be the scary horror movie or they want it to be the silly comedy and if you kind of ride the line down the middle they get a little confused it's a problem with horror comedy but this one nudges a step closer to comedy than it does horror my dog wants to chime in upstairs Um, (laughs) so um uh so in this in this particular case The one thing I wanted to say, going back to that film Courage interview, um, he pitched, and this is why I thought I'd bring it up for this, and because I think this is another way to think of tone. Um, He he kind of he said after they made the movie, the marketing department was like, kind of like, yeah, this thing nobody's going to want to see this, and they kind of just snuck it out there. They were like, this movie nobody, there's no audience for this, right? And um, and his Larry Wilson's thing was that. At the time, you know, he saw a lot of people that liked like the cure. And they were he said he saw a lot of girls like that like the cure. And he was like, That's our audience <laughs> or something. You know, he was like pointing to them. He's like, That's our audience. Um, and when it came out, like some of the demographic were a lot of young, young girls and stuff like that. And the and the, I think the the marketing department guy said to him, they said, uh, yeah, you're lucky that the girls with the black t-shirts came out or something like that. And he was like, he's like, yeah, that's the audience. That's who we wrote it for. That was our I audience. Yeah. And I think that's a good lesson. It's like default Tim Burton audience. Right? Yeah. If you know your audience and, and that's what he said, he said, we knew our audience and we wrote it for them. That's what we did. That's yeah. how we managed tone <laughs> is we figured out exactly. And he, his point was the more specific you can get, with the audience member that you're writing for the better you can track your tone um because you're just writing for a certain person and that is your tone so it's another way to approach tone that i thought was useful when i saw it man jamie that that's great i was gonna say i also think it's worth bringing up the batman tonal scale just because we're literally talking about a tim burton movie yeah (laughs) and if i was gonna place this on the batman tonal scale of Mm -hmm. batman's i mean Uh batman returns and beetlejuice feel 
Yeah. I mean, they, I mean, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. think about the just, penguin and Beetlejuice and just, just like everything. Yeah. I, I was thinking about the penguin, like, Andy, Andy DeVito's right? penguin the entire just, time I was watching like that, it. Yeah. Uh, since we use that scale, it's on the movie. same energy level. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you. Yeah. It, I would place it right over top his other movies, but you're getting yeah, the same yeah. filmmaker, so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, but Jamie, you know what you made me think of? You made me think of the notes process mm-hmm. and how sometimes you're really at the mercy of the taste of the reader. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you'll get a note. I'm talking about like when you've optioned things or when you've yep. hired been hired yep. to do a paid um, sure. rewrite of something and you're dealing with a number of producers and you'll get like one producer's note who clearly is not aligned with what you're going for and the audience that you're writing for. And so their, their note might not be a bad note, but it's a note that doesn't understand the audience that you're writing for. Mm -hmm. So that's a Mm -hmm. man. I've definitely had these moments where I'm like, they don't understand like, like the, the horror people who like this are going to fucking love this. Their note is not wrong. It's just, they don't understand the audience. So that's, that's great, Jamie. I love that. It's almost like if you could agree upon, and, and again, this comes down to tastes and things like that, but if you could agree upon the exact person you're writing it for up front, it might help mm-hmm. in your discussion with those notes. Like if you can Man, just I, say, let's talk about who are the exact person it, we're writing for is. Let's it, think you, about who that person could, is. Yeah. Could you, with this movie specifically, you could also frame it like who you're writing for as far as people that audience would hate. I mean, <laughs> that there's a, I mean, like as an adult <laughs> watching this movie, you can't help but see uh, like Tim Burton or the writers searing hatred of elitist coastal mm-hmm. rich people. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, really, it's making fun of them almost uniformly. It's very satirical about those types of people. Yes, I remember reading mm-hmm. something yesterday about this. Or Bo Welch, the the designer, said that the real villain of the movie is like the design aspects <laughs> that are invading. The that are nice invading home. this yeah. the nice, quiet, beautiful home, yes. small town suburbia, <laughs> and then you look at this ghastly house that she turned it into, and it's like a villain <laughs> outside of Beetlejuice and everything. So there's like this, there's a whole audience that would hate those parents and the people their parents worship. They're obsessed with Maxie Dean. If you hate Maxie Dean, you're the audience for this movie. You know, <laughs> you hate basically if you hate billionaires. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> That's I'm just saying you could use that as far as yeah. kind of people who hate this that type on of person that. would love this <laughs> script. Yep, yep. I I think that's a good point. I I think you if you think about if you pick the per, that specific person, you can think about like the things they would target, the things they would think are funny, the thing you know all that stuff. I mean, I think it all comes into play. If we did Caddyshack, we could talk about the same thing, right? Yeah, it's the same. With golf. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. There's a certain demographic (laughs) there. Um, Mumbo Jumbo. Infinite Mumbo Jumbo. Yeah, We talked about Mumbo Jumbo a few times. Yeah, it's been a long time. So, Jamie, can you explain Blake Snyder's double Mumbo Jumbo? And then I'll I'll go into what I why I put this on the list. Sure thing. Um, So double Mumbo Jumbo is a thing from the Save the Cat. The the first Save the Cat book. Uh, Save the Cat has a has like a chapter the weird physics of screenplays or something like that. It's like kind of this extra chapter that has all these things like double mumbo jumbo. Um, And they're just kind of guidelines for when you're writing scripts, like some other things you've learned. It's like some, a grab bag of extra things and double mumbo jumbo. The concept was uh, basically people will buy one ridiculous thing in a story, but if you add a second ridiculous thing, then it's, it's too much. And I, and, and this isn't, especially nowadays, I don't know that this totally holds because we, because of our marvelization of things like, like, you know, Marvel as magic, superheroes, gods, you know, all these different crazy aliens. Every, every one of their characters has a mumbo jumbo. Yeah. And, and they can mix them in one movie, you know, and, and so it'll be these, this ridiculous, but back in the day, the idea was, if you had magic, then maybe you don't have aliens. You know, that was kind of the idea. This example from the book, he uses Stephen King's Dreamcatcher, which has six different times. He's he basically talks about like it's it's create quote unquote creative magic that's not 
or ordinary. It's extraordinary to our world. Is and, he using Dreamcatcher as a bad example? Yes, yeah. as, as yeah. an example that works in a book because he's got 500 pages to explain the six different types of rules. Uh, you know, they've, there's aliens, there's ghosts, there's uh, possession, there's a, 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 an, a pandemic with its own set of rules. There's, there's two more. There's six different types of like outside of the ordinary magic that uh, impacts the story. And they're all like different and important to the story. And then in the movie, like William Goldman couldn't even make that work in movie form because it doesn't work. Like movies don't work like that. Typically well, you could argue Marvel somehow did it a few times. Right? <laughs> well, they took 32 movies to make that work. Though. That's true. Um, that's that's yeah. when on the, on the Avengers end game, at the time, a lot of the zeitgeist who didn't like Endgame, we we go, I don't know if you remember, but we go at length into this topic because a lot of the complaints, we even read some of our friends' complaints. Yep, which was I remember. Funny, and the, all of <laughs> all of their complaints are to this point. They, they can't handle the 32 mumbo jumbos and they have a problem and they microanalyze. They start microanalyzing the powers and rules and limitations of each one of these things yeah. because they, because the 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 typical arc plot audience they need they can't handle double mumbo jumbo i i think i think what it is is you know in in marvel they established a world yeah and th that world had iron man mm -hmm. and then they said what if in that world they found a hammer and it was like okay and then they had thor and then they said what if in that world they found Wakanda, you know, and it just kept going and going. And then, and then you know, there's a multiverse. And then, yeah. Yeah, then but yeah. you're talking about individual movies on their own. I guess Marvel's playing this mumbo jumbo. Marvel's playing so. with like a TV show level of. Yeah, that's what I'm they, saying. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. So, so personally, I think and and I'm going to use an, a current example. What is the date? It's early October 2020. 10, 10, 24. Example. OK, so Stephen King, Salem's Lot just came out the the most recent adaptation uh gary doberman somebody that jamie always surprises us with these oh yeah i've worked with him i've written yeah. with him gary doberman movie okay so the there's a lot of people that don't like it don't like this current adaptation because it's it basically skips around a lot it feels like it's and apparently there was a cut that was an hour longer and the reason that they cut all this an hour of content from the adaptation is apparently all the test audiences couldn't handle it being both a ghost movie and a vampire movie. So all of the ghost related content, <laughs> the studio took it out. So they're just jumps and leaps and logic and confusing, you know, things are confusing because it is meant to be told with yeah. ghost elements it's and because somebody elements. read that stupid save the cat book and said, this is double mumbo jumbo. <laughs> we have to take it out. But, Oh, that's it's your fault, huh, Jamie? That's what I mean. That's <laughs> right. what he means by double mumbo jumbo. So, and it, it's definitely something sure. that you need to be mindful of when you're writing a spec script, especially if it's new. If it's if it's not vampires and it's not ghosts and something completely unheard of, you can't throw throw a, throw in a second one. Um, it, that's what it's, makes it, that's what makes Beetlejuice great. Is <laughs> There's no genre of Beetlejuice, kind of, right? Right. Well, so Bob, this is like this is what really struck me when I was the, the when I was because I haven't watched it from a screenwriting perspective ever. Sure. Yeah. And immediately I was like, "Holy shit!" The handbook for the recently deceased is a stroke of genius. Sure. Because what they did was they used the Maitlands or the fish out of the water, the ghosts. The ghosts don't know what the fuck is going on, and we're trying to catch up as they're trying to catch up. And every single time the Maitlands are trying to understand the magic that's in front of them, the supernatural, someone's like, didn't you read the handbook? <laughs> like, what's your problem? Like, it's all in the handbook. Every scene where something crazy pops up and the Maitlands are like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. They're like, didn't you read the handbook? It's on the it's on the last page, damn it. It's so literally the, someone complaining about Avengers. Like, Did you see yeah, four? <laughs> exactly. So they they put this, they put this, this, Thing in there they put this object 
and they 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 absolve themselves from having to explain anything by sure. this really comedic joke. It's just every it's we talk about like the easiest way to make exposition go down easy to swallow for the audience is to bury it with the joke. Well, every time the handbook comes up, they just use the same joke over and over. It's the it's in the handbook. Come on. They also um, use the second joke of yeah. it's confusing as hell. Yeah, just like most mumbo jumbo is the it's actual so thing making fun of mumbo jumbo. This thing reads like a stereo instructions. Right. Yeah, they can't yeah, even yeah, understand yeah. it themselves. Right. But I thought what was fascinating and also instructive is within all of that, we don't have any rules. We don't need to explain anything. They very much have a strict set of rules and limitations for Beetlejuice. They that they, they understood that well, we can do all this fun stuff, whatever we want supernaturally, and we can give Beetlejuice as many powers to do as many things as possible. We got to give him I'm one sure. limitation that the yeah. audience can like understand, and it's so simple, right? It's like the Rumple Stillskin thing. It's like uh, say his name three times, and boom. Um, so I thought that was very cool that within all of that, they ended up having strict, simple, easy rules. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like he's obviously not like at first, I think you'd assume that he could be like a god almost. Yeah. <laughs> what he can do, but he's obviously he's got such limitation. Yeah. Really, even though he can do all these crazy tricks. And it's powers. really easy to understand. It's totally easy to understand. That. Yeah. That's what I love about if it. If he could do anything, yeah. he would have gotten to the end game of the movie without all the plot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? You got to give him some. So I guess yeah, I guess yeah. I guess the thing the to sum it up. If you're have if you're if you have a bunch of magic and you're trying to get away with it, figure out what's your version of the handbook for the recently deceased. And if it's a comedy and totally aligned, see if you can make a joke out of it so you can do whatever the hell you want. It's great. Yeah. Simple Beetlejuice rules. Yes, we just did that. No, no, I'm saying I was saying it. <laughs> I'm not saying it as the next point. Just saying it is simple. Uh, character construction, tensity, your new favorite, Jimmy. Yeah, this is my new favorite. We um, did this for the last two? We did it for Logan. I'm not Logan? sure. Logan? We, we, we didn't did do it for Deadpool. Deadpool, but we talked about it. We definitely talked about Logan. Recently, yes. And Logan, we did it. We did the exact thing we're going to do now. Yeah. Um, which is, Jamie, this was something you brought to our attention, and I can't unsee it. I'm seeing it in everything that's great, and I'm going like, this is why it's great. Holy shit. And then I'm seeing it personally in my own work. Recently, I've recognized that a character is not, like, working. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going, oh, shit, it's because there's no tensity in the character. And when I put the tensity in, all of a sudden they pop. So, yeah, you want to explain this? Yeah, yeah. So, um I, I had a good I go back to the last episode and just listen to that. <laughs> I, I had a good definition of it that I can't remember what it was. Um, but tensity, uh, I'm looking at the website that I got this from. There's a website called uh, did, did we the theoretical theoretical. Spell. It's kind of like theater in some ways. It's, yeah, yeah, it's spelled that way. Yeah. yeah, but if you Google tensity and marketing, you'll find this really good article about it. And th this is basically what I'm I've used over time. Uh, they their definition of brand tensity is a little heady for me. I, this wasn't the one I used last time. That's why I'm, no. I'm looking at this. But it's like the convergence of two or more contradictory forces resulting in excitement anticipation and a palpable energy but really not what bad. it's not bad what uh, what where i go with it and we we've been using it mainly for characters but i actually mm -hmm. think it applies to log lines i think it applies mm -hmm. i think it can apply probably to scene work to all kinds it's, of things it's that dramatic irony you're always looking it's for the dramatic yes. irony yes it's, it's in some ways that you have two ideas that are kind of opposed to each other and that's what makes it interesting so it works best by examples and the examples they give marilyn monroe could be described in two words as seductive innocence um the intensity and world building it has for harry potter is magical meets the mundane mm -hmm. uh in star wars it's the mis mystical meets science um and it, it then it goes into characters and it has napoleon dynamite which is audacious meets underdog. Um, it has L Woods as being clever dits. Um, yeah. 
and then star wars and i'll just do these last ones star wars is a humble hero for luke skywalker commanding damsel for princess leia and reliable rogue for han solo and that, that's the, what we have you had batman and superman ones that were yeah really they're good they're good so I fearsome were. fearsome guardian for batman um an epic everyman for superman yeah um yeah and their explanation he's an alien with epic powers but raised on a farm in a small town can in small town right. kansas i mean that's and, and then the you know the one kind of joke in here is like if you find a character that doesn't have tensity it's like and they use jar jar binks as an example <laughs> um it's he's just he's just <laughs> kind of the, the fool you know it, and it's not very interesting mm-hmm. like it's not like genius fool or something like that you know imagine if jar jar was actually a genius or something or, or if know. he had aspirations to be like a great politician or something like, right if that if that he did eventually but if they showed that in the first movie yeah maybe that would have yeah i yeah. intensity <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember this article they say like sith jar jar would be the interesting character that was one of the ideas right yeah um, but it, but it makes it but suddenly he's interesting you know that right, that makes right. him interesting um so so anyway it's this idea that if you kind of have a flat character and a lot of us i think go into scripts at least i do and i'm trying to find a way to figure out who get under the skin of the characters it's just like a mm-hmm. guy he's 30 he's <laughs> broke up with his girlfriend <laughs> and and it's like what and and what i tend to do is i tend to cast like i'll say you know what if it's um what 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 if i cast and i'll do somebody outrageous like bobcat goldthwait in that character or something you know and I'm, i'll just and then i'll start riffing danny and mcbride doing, danny mcbride it's always danny, um, McBride. Always danny <laughs> mcbride <laughs> that, that's how i tend to get under their skin but this this is a better way i think because you can approach it this way and then you can if you still want to do that like cast somebody on top of it even better but if you can kind of come up with these two opposing ideas just to have a handle on them, like this character is this meets this, it'll I think it'll ensure you that you're starting to move away from a one dimensional character into a two dimensional mm-hmm. character. I was also going to say, like two movies I can think of recently that use this really well, uh, Barbie and Free Guy, um, char- two characters that have no tensity at all mm-hmm. and then are given intensity by something that occurs you know like their awareness like, changes their yeah. awareness changes thus creating intensity but, but at the as the start of the movie they have literally none they're that's you know, they're, great they're, they're, they're very yes they're very they, interesting characters until something changes their awareness All right that's great so the yeah so, so, so the bit, movie yeah so in beetlejuice i i'll throw out the characters i mean no pressure to but you can riff if you want i felt like i came up with some for each one of the main characters hit i took us, i kept us. otho okay i'll just hit you <laughs> otho okay. yeah i to took otho, otho off of those but if you wanted to do them um so the maitlands to me it's like the casper factor they're friendly ghosts that's like that they, they're 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 their mm-hmm. whole tension is them trying to figure out how to be scary <laughs> like that's that for me that's the simple tension there like their entire journey is about them trying to like figure out how to scare these people right it's it, i yeah i would think something like that that's i think your friendly ghost is great i mean that's yeah, a great one it works um yeah because i was i was thinking like barbara would be like soft-willed fighter or something you know what i mean like like this she's she's fighting they she's become not, fighters by yeah. the end of it yeah that's what they change into yeah and yeah. then or, they, they or definitely like, become fighters yeah. like timid protector for adam or something <laughs> like that you know what i mean yeah, like yeah. there's there's some weird mix of the two that's they good both definitely have a very clear masculine feminine switch mm-hmm. on both of them i don't know if that's ever been discussed but that's it yeah i can she, see that she's kind of like the she's the one who like it feels like almost the part was reversed like that would have been alec baldwin's half of the things that happened to her is what i mean that's good yeah. um lydia for me this was the hardest one but I, I try to focus on the emotional side. Rather, I was getting like wrapped up in the goth stuff. Um, but I think it's sentimental cynic because everything she says is like, I hate life and blah, 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 blah. But she really like craves family and connection and love. And everything that comes out of her mouth sounds like, like pessimistic and dark. But ultimately, like she's got 
like she's an emotional character who she's like, more sensitive than the whole family yes so I, that's like, that sentimental cynic is what i, I put on yeah I, I i had like sensitive rebel is yeah. what Ooh, I had. That's, that's, good. that's 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 better yeah. i like that better i'm putting this the sensitive rebel i was gonna say dark <laughs> darkly perceptive but I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of what Jamie said. Just mm-hmm. worse. It's, we're all three of us are saying, but anyway, I mean, I think that what sensitive rebel is what makes her pop, right? That's what yep. makes her interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, Delia, I said tacky sophisticate because like, she's very sophisticated and like ha- feels like she has great taste, but everything she makes. Is you can even say hacky. So hacky. <laughs> yeah, that would work. <laughs> but yeah. 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 Um, and I think everything that's interesting about her character comes out of her, like thinking she's like this sophisticated person and all her shit is like wacky and crazy. She wants to be um, interesting for her art. Yet she's interesting for her, for her. <laughs> because she, <laughs> She's a character, not her artwork. What comes yeah. out of her is not interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I wasn't sure. Like this might be too much of a read reach like i might be looking into her character more but i i had insecure visionary as what i oh thought. that's good that's she good. uses otho for all of her inspiration that's I mean, yeah that's good it's like she's you say that, that characters can have more than one intensity right sure Maybe. sure yeah. i mean <laughs> and, and really this is less for looking backward and more for looking forward more anyway. for idea yeah. generation mm-hmm. to get you something right, unique. right yeah yeah um charles this one <laughs> i was trying to do wordplay here um I said genial gentrifier because he comes off as this nice guy who loves the town and loves the charm of the house, but he wants to destroy it and sell it and turn it into a tourist attraction, including the ghost themselves. Very good. Genial gentrifier. Because that's what makes him interesting, right? When you meet him, he's like very soft spoken and he seems like the nice guy in the crowd. And then he's like, I can sell the whole town. Like he's like, fuck this town. Like, yeah um he's such uh, he's clamp from gremlins 2 <laughs> that was the first thing that came to mind right and this must have been a big problem specifically <laughs> in the late 80s because we see it pop up in these movies is like the villain wants to sell the town um but uh and then beetlejuice i did this last because of what we're going to do next um i think he's the easiest i said charismatic creep Mm-hmm. Um, yeah yeah i was like, trying to figure out something like that sometimes the words are the hardest thing like i was yeah like, yeah i was like charming I, menace I, or i was gonna or, say yeah. chaotic charmer That's what yeah I was so say. we all three were yeah. circling yeah. around the same thing th- so yeah i think something like um playful monster or playful predator or something like playful that. predator yeah. is interesting uh, yeah 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 he definitely is a predator. I mean, yeah, so. he's a predator. <laughs> <laughs> the one angle that's off discussed now. Yes, the... yes. But then again, he's also hundreds of years old, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't... Well, the po- but but anyway, I think Beetlejuice proves once again, Jamie, that this this technique is very imp- like it helps big time. I love I love. Did you this. say They're your my new one? favorite? Did you I say didn't do Otho? Otho. You want to do Otho? Try it. I know. I don't. I, I didn't have one. I thought you wrote one down. I didn't do Otho. Okay. I stayed away. Yeah. It's like some kind of a, I don't know, hollow intellectual. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's that, pretty good. Is that, is that good? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. He is yeah. smart. He can yeah. figure stuff out, but he also is like nothing inside of him. There's, he's just, yeah. Nothing. Like he actually is scared heartless. of wearing a certain <laughs> color suit. Okay, like <laughs> it's nothing. To <laughs> right? Yeah, there's nothing that was to one of my favorite parts when yeah, we watch. It's, it's such a it's such a weird unexplained joke kind of thing. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, they don't really set it up except for knowing who he is as a person. Yeah, they don't and, say, and it's not yeah. on the news. Maybe at all. there used to it's be not. a Labor Day time setting at some point in there, and yeah. he's wearing I'm wearing white. Yeah, for Labor Day. It's light blue, isn't it? Or am I colorblind? I, I, think I think it is. Light, I think it's a, I think it's light it's blue. Color. Oh, it's light blue. It's, I've always thought it was because it was pastels or something. Yeah, it's very light. It's I'm like the joke in Adam's Family Values. Pastels. I, I, I just yeah. like kind of how it happens, and it's like you figure it out. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like they just do this weird joke, and it's like, <laughs> and he's willing to murder other people in the house, and then that's what he does to him. That right. Yeah, <laughs> that's how much Beetlejuice knows that would affect him. <laughs> anyway, and I mean, perfect. Beetlejuice's reverse rooting resume. Okay, so um, <laughs> I thought this would be another good one. So this is this comes from Jamie's Save the Cat uh, TV book, uh, and on sale uh, now. On sale. <laughs> on sale now. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, so I like quoting Jamie's own techniques back to him and having him go, oh, oh I said that. That's that's good. Um, but uh, <laughs> we did this from the villain side. So, OK, so what we found is using Jamie's rooting resume that usually makes for a character you root for, you can subvert some of these and it makes for a great compelling villain and it's been a fun exercise to do this and see maybe you could use this re resume and reverse it in unique ways for your villain and make a good villain so uh we did this in case anybody wants to if you like this other examples are we did this for immortan joe uh we did this for michael myers we did this for hannibal lecter we did this for the alien in alien we did this for Ghostface and scream and we did this all the way back with biff uh in back to the future episode so and it it every time it comes up with really interesting responses so um you guys feel free to riff on this uh sure. as i read it so um this one's interesting they're under number one they're underdogs um yeah yes I mean, yeah, isn't that, isn't that why like you kind of you kind of that's the reason I love Beetlejuice is because even though he's I did all these powers, he's a fuck up. Yeah. Juno says he's a fuck up. He's kind of a loser and he's only good at one thing. Everything I think else you pointed. Yeah. yeah sorry, you're just sorry. saying Juno is perfect because it, yeah. it's it, it is it is inverted. Like he's a he's an underdog because he's an asshole. Like he, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's that's an what underdog I'm saying. Yeah. for being a bad guy. Yeah. For met, for ruining people's lives, trying to hurt people, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he is a fuck up. He's an Jamie, underdog. Within fuck this, up. within this section, you have their Rodney Dangerfields. They mm -hmm. get no respect, and I do think that's oh, still yeah. the case. Like, I, I think in some ways he's like borrowing a little bit from Rodney Dangerfield. Like, you could almost imagine Rodney Dangerfield playing that role. Yeah, Rodney, Rodney Dangerfield, <laughs> like Easy Money era Rodney Dangerfield. Yeah, I yeah. Can see it. So, yeah. So, okay, so it checks, but it's kind of like a subverted version of their underdogs. They're underdogs for being an asshole. Um, he's in a number two. They care about someone or something. I think in this case, he doesn't care about anyone from but himself. Yeah. And that's why it makes it a nice subversion. He's as deep as a puddle. And that's yeah. how if any if I had to applaud the sequel for anything, they keep him as deep as a puddle. And that's, that's awesome. You know what I mean? Like you can't I still haven't seen it yet. I'm not yeah. spoiling anything. I'm just it, saying it would be easy to make him the hero in that. Or, or something like, like you that. You know, pull yeah. a Terminator too almost. <laughs> but no, he is he's he is he is not <laughs> there's nothing there. He's so, just pure id. Right? So the yeah. exactly. That's yeah. that's that's a perfect way to describe it. The the but so so there you go, Jamie. Jamie's second resume section once again it checks the box but in a negative way right um uh number three this this one i think checks it in like a positive way uh they try very hard to make their lives better they have a dream <laughs> or a plan a way out i mean <laughs> he has failures, a plan. They flat out they <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um so it checks that box uh they're fun i mean this is the easiest one they're fun whether it's the gift of gab or just next level charming. They're, I mean, yes. It's, rarely man. has there been a character. So I said to Jamie before we started recording, like when you realize the effect Beetlejuice has had on culture up until now before the sequel, and it's only been one movie. Like, you know what I mean? It's just nuts. Like, like that's how charming this character is. <laughs> <laughs> um, number five. This one, I think, is another big time inversion we know their secret struggle um i don't feel like we know anything about him we know absolutely nothing he about has no him. internal struggle yeah, he just so wants like to the, get, this, yeah he wants the, to get to the real world so he can <laughs> have more crap <laughs> like, right so right. we know nothing about his internal and that's the way it completely subverts it. <laughs> you got to ask yourself, too, why does he even want to be in the real world? Yeah. Never what is he that. going to do? <laughs> um, number six, we wish we were more like him. <laughs> this is another one. I say, I mean, he's a gross misogynistic asshole. I don't think <laughs> anybody wants to be like I think, him. I think people I'll dress up be... like him as Halloween yeah. when I'm 10. <laughs> I think people would want to have his level of charisma and wit. Charisma? Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. And he's not, it's like his witticism is good. He's, mm -hmm. 
he's good at making jokes and thinking up stuff on his feet. So there is something desirable about him. That's his true. His personality in that way, but you don't want to Yeah, be... I mean, that's why he's an icon, for right. sure. Um... But you don't want to be a misogynistic, <laughs> murderous, <laughs> gross asshole. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, number seven, they're just like us. They share common mundane problems. <laughs> this is another one that's a complete opposite. Like no one can relate to being like an <laughs> interdimensional supernatural being who's like trapped. Who died during the plague. Say, yeah, who's <laughs> yeah. trapped unless you say his name three times. And <laughs> so it, it, it subverts this in the complete opposite way. And then this is my favorite one. They're the best at something. They have talents. He's um, the ghost with the ghost the most the ghost with the most <laughs> so yeah so this is another one that i think jamie's rooting resume shows that you can use it to create villains just as much as you can use it to create heroes that was like the thing i really wanted to do so this is oh, thanks guys should have done that with delia yeah it would have been good it I'm not probably, saying, would, I'm not, it probably I'm, would have subverted a bunch of them I'm not, I'm not saying we should i'm just saying i bet she hers would be just as interesting in many yeah. ways because yeah. the movie doesn't like her. Yes. You know what I mean? So she's kind of half a villain in this movie. I was really surprised in the end that, like, they kept her, like, they treated her kind of kindly in the end. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? Like, she's on the cover of a magazine in the background. Like, <laughs> well, she's also married to someone super rich. That's true. That's so she point. can make things happen because of money, not because of talent. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, premise pretzels. <laughs> Um, yeah, this one I had to reel myself in. You might have to reel me in more while we're doing it because there's so many examples. Okay. <laughs> Jamie, do you want to explain uh, premise pretzels for everyone? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so premise pretzels are, they're kind of a whiteboard idea. So before you write the script, like, and you're coming up with things the premise suggests of how to use your setup and payoffs to like the, on steroids, um, because it's, it's like set up, pay off, pay off, pay off, pay off in some ways, if you can. But the reason it's called a premise pretzel is because the way I think it's best to look at these things. So if you have a setup, if you have something you're introducing, like, I don't know, we're, we're gonna, about to get to some, like the sandworms or something, is, is look at them from multiple angles. Like, like mm-hmm. try to come at them. You know, there's obvious payoffs, like, we introduce the sandworm and then they pay off in a big way in the end. Like they kill Beetlejuice or not kill him, but eat him or whatever. But then there's other ways you could pay these things off too. And to try to look at them from all directions, like, you know, how do they, how, how are they a nuisance to the heroes? How do they help the heroes? How do they, you know, and just kind of constantly looking at things from a different direction and coming up with multiple payoffs and that's the pretzel because they kind of fold back on themselves. And the, the ones we've talked about in this are the ones that have almost, what, what's the word? They're, they're almost, uh, what's, I'm trying to think of the right word, reflections of, they're yes. kind of dark reflections. They're reversals. They, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, yeah. They could almost be like called premise reflections in some ways. Yes. Is another yeah. part of the, premise tensities. <laughs> yeah. In some yeah. ways, that's what it is. But, yeah. you know, we, we've talked about like the one that always, is predator we kind of came up with a few but is how um in the beginning the they can't see the creature and the creature is hunting them and then in the end arnold is invisible and he's hunting the creature and that's kind of an example so they did a camouflage premise pretzel they basically made a whiteboard of how many different ways can we use the camouflage itself and the concept of that yeah yeah right yeah and uh, Jamie, my favorite couple things that you say that I like to preach um, to my clients is when you're reading a pro script, what besides the, the, the fact that like everything is premise specific, the other thing is you've described a pro script experience as just a relentless exercise in setup payoff. Right. Like a- nearly everything that's on the page is either a setup or a payoff or another payoff. That's it's, right. It, there's there's no wasted. Everything gets. We gotta repeated. do hot but, clothes. Um, we gotta do hot clothes. It's, <laughs> it's the it's we the, should. It's yeah. the biggest differentiator. Like knee, you know, kind of knee jerk, quick differentiator. I see when I see a pro. Like I see a lot of the other things. There's similarities sometimes in storytelling and things like that. But the one thing is, 
those pro scripts just are relentlessly set up payoff. They never miss a setup payoff at all. And it's it's funny because when I do notes for people, when I do consulting like Jimmy does, um, I'm I'm kind of relentless on like I'll just <laughs> see something. You know what I mean? Like I'll see something and I'll be like, this should be paid off. This should be paid off. Mm-hmm. And I I think sometimes it's wasted on the audience I'm telling it to again, not, they're just yeah, not yeah. ready to do it, you know? Right. Yeah. But I see it and it just ticks something off in my head. Like I'll just see something and it'll, they'll introduce a character and, and that character will never come back. And I'll be like, no, this must be, this character must come back or, mm-hmm. or I'll see, you know, a situation, a funny situation. And I'll be like, Oh, this can come back. This should be paid can off. Give be reversed um, in a way you didn't expect. Yeah, yeah, and I'm constantly just going through and being like, "Oh, this should be paid off. This should be paid off. This should be paid off." And there's, it, honestly, it's like in most pro scripts, it's almost relentless how much. Yeah, it's never. Happen. It's all in that. Even even in just like little dialogue pieces too. Yep, dialogue um, pieces as well. Um. So so. The town model whiteboard. I figured I let Bob riff on this because it's there's so many. I could just I mean, like the way it uses the town model. It's a whiteboard of itself, right? Yeah, I, I mean the setup. <laughs> yeah, but do I mean riffing? You don't even have to. It's like the whole thing is about Alec Baldwin building the town model, and then it turns yeah. into this gateway to Beetlejuice's. Basically, it's Beetlejuice's layer sort of yeah. that acts as that. But the entire thing, I mean, how many things you got, you got the brothel, the tree, it's where they first meet mm-hmm. Beetlejuice. It's where they're sucked into when they say the mm-hmm. words, right? Mm-hmm. It's what the he car. comes out, it's what he comes out of. Yep. It's how and he what appears they go in into world. when they start to weaponize right. the model. Yeah. It's uses it's this it. gateway to, to his realm, whatever. Like they don't use the door that they make. I always thought that was interesting. They don't, they make the whole door thing, which is fine, but they don't use that with Beetlejuice. He has his own doorway, which is the, which is the model. But yeah, the whiteboard's yeah. great. Uh, yeah. The car you said, uh, even I lo- the, the line of why did you build that? It's like, wait, Be- <laughs> Beetlejuice is building stuff in the model himself. In the model he's creating right. within it. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, they took the, the time car, and they the were car like- actually works. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah. I love the little reminder you know and that's why it's like it was just an example i was watching that there's a there's a scene later as we're approaching the finale where charles is just playing with the model and he takes the car and he just goes and like shows the car moving and it's like it's you would think it would it's a nothing burger but it's an it matters because what it's doing is reminding the audience that that car is there because it's going to become important in a few minutes but anyway also um, also put i would say this could you get added to it putting the uh the model in the attic the one place in the house that wasn't remodeled yes <laughs> the model perfect. was where nothing was remodeled so that it could stay <laughs> to fully intact and then be brought down later yeah. like the actual positioning of it was thought about yeah you know like, and yeah. and the fact that they move it to the main area that's a good point. right I'm thinking about and that's that. where that's, that's how he yeah. emerges from it and yeah everything. man yeah. um so uh Delia statues whiteboard. So, so this is the, to to what Jamie's talking about. How you like you just stretch the idea in all the different ways. Like, and you say, okay, we got these statues. In a lesser script, what would happen is you introduce the character, and she's having these statues brought in, and we have that exposition. She's like, don't be careful with those, and that's how we learn. And then that's it. The statues are never brought back again. They're never mentioned again. And in fact, for the reader, they'd probably not even you'd probably not even remember they were there. And this is like a typical experience, but they took the time and they were like, okay, we got these cool statues. And I'm sure Tim Burton was involved in this idea generation. Of they course. look like uh, he made them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. The, the, and they go like, how many different ways can we take that idea we established really fast and just keep using them? Um, and so like, uh, one of my favorite ways is just like subtle. They, when, when he says, Barbara, we're home, and behind them in the background is just all those statues in like an like, atrium area yeah right. it looks nothing like their home so it's just like an instant visual indicator of how things have changed and the invasion is complete right 
um the jump scare when when charles is looking out the window <laughs> and the thing comes through uh the dinner party of course when when the when the chairs when everything comes to life beetlejuice animating one to attack charles in his study and then eventually they're all animated and imprisoned delia and charles during the wedding scene and that's, then adam weaponizes it too so it's just like that's the ultimate payoff right it's like the beginning of the movie she almost dies because of one of her statues at the end of the movie they're trying to kill her they're they come to him. life yeah to yeah him. yeah set up so that's just like the direct setup payoff right yeah, yeah. and a ref, like J- reflection Jamie put earlier of, the negative reflection right they reverse she yeah, says she so. doesn't want to die from them and then she's going to die from them <laughs> <right>? <laughs> so so i don't need to go into more of these i mean i there's so many like the sandworms all the different ways they use the sandworm and some of the interesting ones is like beetlejuice kind of turns into a sandworm when he attacks the maitland you know and uh like we see them in the we see them in the handbook and then barbara then reverses it to jamie's point and rides the sandworm that she feared all this time in order to you know get Be- beetlejuice finally right. um and then my my favorite one is the harry belafonte and th- even that is like repetition right we get our setup that's like very ordinary he's listening to harry belafonte while he works on the model and they imbue it imbue it with meeting with the deo and then it comes back again more heller harry belafonte music in the end with lydia floating so it's just i think this movie one of the best things it does from a screenwriting perspective is how they do all these premise pretzels and there's all these whiteboards for all the cool stuff i didn't even mention all the fun handbook whiteboarding all the the wedding dress and tux has its own whiteboard yep there's a joke they find it in the club yeah uh the sheets and the polaroids are used like seven different times the even just (laughs) the sheets and the polaroids have its own whiteboard so anyway this is an example this is an example of the afterlife learn how to do that the afterlife being like you know a bureaucratic hellhole you could even say there's setups and payoffs <laughs> there. Like, uh, if you remember at the dinner scene, um, Otho says, "Like, I heard if you commit suicide, you become in the afterlife, you become a social worker." That's and that j- and Bob, that was what I <laughs> doesn't, what, know, that was, doesn't know that he's right. Yeah, but that, that, the movie. I don't know what the if there's a code for this, Jamie, but there's a type of joke this movie does a lot, which is what Bob just explained, where someone says something to, to them that is mundane. It's a joke, but <laughs> we laugh because we know it's true. Like when they're when they're standing below the act and they're like, it's probably the dead people who died here, you know, like mm-hmm. we're trying to get us out. You know, yeah. it's there's there's like ten examples of that. And I, I don't know what the code for that is, but it's it's a type of joke this movie uses a lot that I love. Um, where they don't realize yeah. they're right it's they're right yeah, and that's it, why it's funny it's yeah. kind of like using audience superiority as yeah, for yeah. humor or something yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. For, it's funny because it's true <laughs> right. um <laughs> um that's a long code but, but, but anyway if yeah. if you're out there and you're like okay I don't, i'm trying to understand this this idea of premise pretzel like what is it and we talked about it on batman returns mm. so yeah. tim burton loves this stuff um it, it's just like there's if you have something consolidation is your friend you know we always talk about like a lot of scripts don't have enough ideas in them but that can they can there can also be the opposite end where there's too many ideas and not enough repurposed ideas and i think if you can figure out how to consolidate all the people places things you have and use them twice three times and in this in the case of this movie six seven eight times for one idea um that's when you're really going to start like looking like a pro so good stuff um yeah man and last but not least structure and the end structure in the this end is, is, this, is this yours jamie yeah this is one of mine um so there's a couple of things i wanted to talk about with structure first um it's so i'm going back to the film courage interview and larry wilson has a section where he talks about structure and he basically says he doesn't believe in structure and he doesn't say say the cat at all like this is an older interview so i'm not even sure how popular it was when he did it but he kind of hints at it because he says anything that tells you page 12 you know you have to have this ignore it you know and things like that (laughs) um so he basically you know he kind of is like i I wouldn't say he's anti-structure but he's one of the guys it reminds me a lot of the not that aaron sorkin was anti-structure at all but it reminds me of his master class where the bulk of the master class really says what Larry Wilson says in this interview. He's basically like, if you set up your hero with a big problem, 
Um, and then you can just talk about how your hero is, try to get out of that problem, you know? And he said, that's what he does. And that's how he approaches it. And he doesn't really think about the rest of it. Um, now, so I'm going to say two things about this. One is Save the Cat actually has a beat sheet this week. If you go to the savethecat.com of Beetlejuice, they just put it up. Oh, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you can go check it out. They they do that a lot. They they run parallel to what we're doing in that way a lot. Um, so they are a big can, fan. Yeah, yeah, you can go check that out. Um, and it's a good beat sheet. I, I read it. Um, and it I think it's it's pretty good until the end. In the end, it gets weird, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, <laughs> so here's the problem. I'm going to kind of, I, I'm not going to say, first of all, I think you can write a screenplay any way you want. There are great screenplays that are written without any thought to any craft or anything. They, somebody <laughs> just sits down and types and it comes out great. There's many, you know. Tarantino. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and if you have the right instincts and the right taste, anybody can do anything. I mean, I, I'm not somebody to say, one way is better than the other. I, I'm going to give an example, though. When I when I heard him say this, I thought about it, and I was like, yeah, he's right. But, and I had a but, because over the summer I worked with someone who was writing a screenplay, uh, doing co some consulting. And um, I'll, I'll give you an example of why that isn't always the best answer for everyone. Like, some people can't wait to hear that. Like, some people love hearing that, and they're like, oh, I could throw all those Save the Cat books away. Um, I can ignore all that stuff. Um, but like, so I was working on a script and Jimmy, you can chime in here cause you probably had similar, similar experiences that uh, I'm going to, I'm going to change it around a little bit. Let's say it was about a person who was going to lose their grandmother's house or something. We'll go with the happy Gilmore type story. Um, unless they sold a million dollars in encyclopedia Britannica, um, <laughs> encyclopedias okay, okay. And, i i, I want to see it already okay rob okay. schneider <laughs> is, okay sorry and it's and it's set today so the obstacle is nobody <laughs> wants an encyclopedia <laughs> um, uh, so this is my my pit this is actually the script i'm currently writing i'm just pretending like it's not my <laughs> he's no. getting just feedback that's right i'm getting feedback from the this podcast. is jamie's, it's gold, this it's gold, is, jamie. This yeah. is jamie's megalopolis <laughs> yeah exactly exactly um I'm, I'm hoping it, <laughs> and think of all the merchandising we can sell all right. these encyclopedias after. oh right. my god um, so by the way <laughs> encyclopedias were like the coolest coolest thing when i was a kid they were like oh, so yeah. cool they were so Same. exciting to have like a book of knowledge you remember we, when the first digital encyclopedia came about out with I, encarta and it was like huge god. it was wasn't it on on cds and you had to yeah. put them in and yes. stuff yeah um but having those books of knowledge it's so weird how people can't we'll never understand that again you know it's just doesn't make sense because it's all out there but anyway um so that, imagine that's the story <clears throat> so this person had that and that's a big problem so you had the big problem and the hero had to get their way out of it but the problem was it just became a series of gags of trying to sell encyclopedias um and there were a lot of other things that if you just followed that rule you wouldn't necessarily do right but if you had instincts like larry wilson or quentin tarantino you probably would do it right because there's a lot you, you know there'll be a million other things you did besides just how did they solve the problem but in this case it was just a guy who just kept doing similar things over and over um there was no escalation there was no bigger obstacles it just kept trying to sell them in different ways and in funny ways so but, it's like a sitcom more than a movie. Yeah, it was just one after right. another of these things. And and most of my notes were like, there's no cause effect here. It's just a series of gags. And the gags were super funny. Um, uh, and and all that stuff worked. But it was like, no, it was just the same thing. It was just, you can imagine if it was just somebody, okay, it's Tuesday. I'm going to try to sell them this way. You know, I'm going to dress up like somebody or something. And uh, I'm, by the way, this this storyline was not what it was. It was something completely different. <laughs> but, but this is um, nice. You're but you should write this. Right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> you should also make it real. Yeah. Or, or they they went, you know, they they pulled a Harold Hill from the Music Man or something. Or I don't yeah, know. They yeah, did. Yeah. They kept doing all these different things. But there was no, like, the, the one on page 40 of the script wasn't necessarily um, – that might be the biggest, coolest one. And then the one on page 60 of the script might have been the lesser one. And there was Smaller. no there was no organization yeah. or escalation. There was no mm -hmm. stake raising. 
there was no um in this case it was kind of a tactile and arc but it really didn't consider arc or how arc fit into it mm -hmm. so if you just followed larry wilson's it idea flat. It, it would be flat now what larry wilson isn't saying is he was a script developer he read a thousand scripts and he had all these things instinctually he knew how to write a script he knew how to give mm -hmm. notes he knew how to give himself notes um so i'm not saying you have to use save the cat to figure what i just set out but i'm just saying that for larry wilson um there's there there's so much more to it that all these things are potential ways to help you figure them out if you don't have it or you don't know how to hold your feet to the fire that's usually what it is yeah. it's like you don't know that you need all these things sometimes even though you know these things exist sometimes you don't know so it's kind of my little rant of why i sort of disagree with the advice again i don't really even disagree with the advice if you're quentin tarantino larry wilson or some other genius that just you got all that stuff down so much you're going to write a good story because it's not so much it's ignore the rules it's just you know all the rules you know you have such good taste and such storytelling talent you don't need any of these helpers you don't need any anybody to hold your feet to the fire because you're going to hold your own feet to the fire and make a great script and i'm sure that's what larry wilson and mike mcdowell did so anyway that was that was my one point after i heard that <laughs> I, I just wanted to talk about that because it did remind me of the script i read this year which probably it did kind of ignore all that stuff and it did just have a bunch of random episodic encounters to try to achieve a goal and overcome a staggering problem and it wasn't a good script because of that i mean and it had good things in it it just needed to be organized better it needed more organization it needed more um, of these tools it needed more of this kind of stuff um so anyway that's my one that's my rant for structure for everyone. by the way your, your defense my of, defense yeah. and by the way save the cat um i think if you go to that save the cat site i think beetlejuice feels like a script that follows save the cat it, it, it has a catalyst it has a debate it has a break into it has a midpoint and it feels like it and i i'm sure that's because larry wilson and mike mcdowell just know how to tell a good story and all save the cat did was kind of codify some points that are common um but it, but it, it it flows right into the save the cat model and all that so that aside the one thing i did want to talk about was how this movie reminded me of the exorcist and i can't remember what exactly we said about the exorcist but i know one thing we said the title was the exorcist but the exorcist really only shows up for the last 10 minutes <laughs> and and when the when the exorcist shows up for the last 10 minutes the the heroes of the story kind of take a back seat yeah they kind of are like okay you're off screen we're going to bring in this new character that's the title character and he's going to kind of be there and there's other things that are going to happen this is kind of a reverse because this is he is an exorcist he is doing an exorcism of sorts so i i don't know if they were inspired at all by the exorcist like like let's i mean do they the reference same structure. it in the movie they do um i'm not sure if they looked at that structure and said that's what we should do you know we should you know we'll the title character will be beetlejuice he'll show up the last 10 minutes he'll do his exorcism and then we'll do you know that'll be the thing um but it it is an interesting movie in that that happens at the very you know at the very end and um yeah i don't really have a point yeah. about it it's just uh something that's i i just noticed that it's the same as the exorcist it know, was like, so long ago it was an, it was all, all, i think a year ago it was last october that we did exorcist one thing i remembered was that the uh damien and ellen burston character they don't we're waiting for them to like connect and there's yep. tension about them connecting. And that takes yep. like nearly like 75% yep. of the movie. Yep. And that's, that's not too similar. That's not, that's similar to this. I mean, Lydia and the Lydia's perspective and the Maitland's perspective finally connect at the midpoint, but then you also have the deets is after and then Beetlejuice. So we have kind of like four POVs and they all kind of don't, hit together to your point jamie until like 75 percent. do you think also jamie like it's also about the character in question like uh especially for beetlejuice maybe not as much for father Merriman. beetlejuice there's not <laughs> you can't have 90 minutes of beetlejuice because there's <laughs> nothing there you know like he's he is he is a one note on per intentionally a one note 
character, right? <laughs> so there's nothing to do with it. It's just, it's all fat, right? Like if you had more of him and more of the story, there's really not that much to do with him because there's no digging. Father Marin, we kind of get his whole story that everything we need from it. We don't mm-hmm. need more runtime with him to get where he's going. He's kind of the half yeah. man, right? We talked about that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like we like his whole deal is just that you don't need more of it. You think it's like a byproduct of the fact that you just don't need more of those characters, but <laughs> when you get them, you're like that's the story. But you don't need. It is. It's all you need. You're it's get all. You, you it's literally all you need of those char- those yeah. specific characters. I'm just trying to remember guess seeing. Why an, you're I remember a seeing an interview with uh, Keaton about the second one, where yeah, all yeah. the atta- all the attempts that he did, he said no to, it was because there was too much Beetlejuice, and he was like, "I need to not be in this much in order for it to work." I think th- um, uh, <laughs> we didn't say it yet, but he's only in this movie for 17 and a half minutes. Wow. So wow, you know, and I think, and that's weird, right? Because it feels like so much more. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like the amount of time that Joker Heath Ledger's Joker is in the Dark Knight. He's only or in it for like twenty there's minutes. Six minutes of CGI in Jurassic Park. <laughs> wow, you Holy know, shit. like something like that. Like you find that you're like, wait, that's not that can't be true, but it feels so much bigger because you're kind of getting everything. It's so yeah. well executed. You're getting just what we need and all you need more. it satisfies that and that's vibe. why you're seeing a parallel mate i don't know like you only yeah. need that much of father marin you only need this much of beetlejuice and a good storyteller knows that a bad storyteller would be like it's beetlejuice the whole time <laughs> he goes hawaiian and he's going wacky you know, <laughs> he's doing wacky stuff you know i don't know i'm just guessing it's there is something uh the horror aspect of it and in my one day to be released horror book um the one thing I've found kind of studying all these horror things and, and with you guys studying all these horror things is many, many horror movies are kind of slow burn in some yeah. ways, as we know. And in the end, they devolve into a battle of survival. They all do. Um, there's some kind of battle of survival. Some, some of them happen right from the beginning, like Evil Dead or something like that. Yeah, they happen yeah. from the 20 minute mark or something, and it just keeps coming. But there there somewhere becomes a true war for survival and i think this follows that model where it's kind of even though you wouldn't call this slow burn because of the comedy and all the stuff and and it's not slow burn by any stretch but from a horror perspective in some ways it's slow burn you know that's true that's a um, yes the demon doesn't show up till the end the demon shows up in the end and then it becomes a battle for survival and it really it it exhilarates so fast um that's that's the part i don't really remember i that, you know not the rewrite beetlejuice but i can see a version of this movie that they summon beetlejuice midpoint or something right he, he kind of steers the car like he's coaching them or he's trying things and then his full plan is revealed around all is lost and we realize oh no he's gonna do some horrible thing and he wasn't going to help them ever. Yeah, he was never going to help. It's kind of a trick or something. I also throw out there, I don't know if Beetlejuice is smart enough or they'd want him <laughs> to be smart enough to steer the vehicle. That's it's true. But um, I, especially I, after seeing the sequel and just thinking about that, you know what I mean? Like I, he's not think, a smart guy. I think that's where some of the comedy could come from, though. Is sure. That yeah. his, his horror things are tropey, yeah. but ridiculous. You know what I mean? Right. Like that he's trying to do. Um Anyway, I'm not going to go back in time and rewrite Beetlejuice. There's no need to. It's perfectly fine. It works works just as well. Um, uh, but I, The runtime yeah. issue, though, is something that's been discussed ad nauseum, though. So I think that what you brought up is literally Michael Keaton was saying it. So what what's the runtime issue? I, I, uh, the Michael new Keaton one? said, well, like Jimmy said, Michael Keaton was insistent upon in the sequel. there only being as much Beetlejuice as oh, the first movie. Gotcha. Like he didn't want to. I think Beetlejuice goes Hawaiian was like he's the main character. That's why that <laughs> never happened because he wouldn't do that. Gotcha, gotcha. You know, yeah. a movie about Beetlejuice is a mistake because that would have to give him depth and a character arc and make him. You don't want to do that, right? Which will undo that reverse rooting resume we just went through that makes him so. Yeah. Such a great villain. Such a great I, yeah. entity, right? I, yes. I vaguely remember the cartoon, but surely the cartoon must have softened him up, right? 
absolutely oh yeah, yeah. he's basically a yeah. good guy in he's a cartoon. good guy yeah yeah right. yeah yeah i think the cartoon's responsible too for a lot of the pop culture uh longevity mm -hmm. right because yeah. yeah. i mean that cartoon was huge to me but yeah. that's, that's where it came from okay i think it even made me r misremember that that the Maitlands are the main characters of this, right? Because right. Lydia is the main character of the cartoon that was such a big part right. of our, right? Yes, it's like the Little Shop of Horrors cartoon. You remember that? Yeah, where Seymour was <laughs> him. He was friends with Audrey too, and then Audrey yeah. too was good. <laughs> they had a knack for doing that. Right? I, Man, I, unlocking I, a wave of memories. I, I didn't even yeah. know there was a Little Shop of Horrors. Cartoon. Yeah, it was just called yeah. Little Shop, and uh, it was oh, Seymour as yeah. a kid. I remember. Seymour as a kid, <laughs> and. And Audrey too was good, but an alien and with power. I love Jamie's stuff. face. Like, uh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I remember it now. Yeah, I'm not recommending it to you, Jamie. I... <laughs> you gotta see it. Jamie. You gotta binge it, Jamie. Be Beetlejuice always reminded me of a character, though, that could have a crossover movie with some other universe. I'm not sure what universe that would be. It would have to be comedy and similar in tone in some weird way. But I always thought he could end up in some other universe. It's it's kind of it, Marvel. Like, it's, no, no. But it is kind of nuts that it took this long. I know. I I, I will say that that's yeah. the, always. But it, that goes to show how protective I guess Michael Keaton was. Of it. We we still don't have a David S. Pumpkins movie. What's going on with that? No, thank you. No. <laughs> but if you were to make a date, well, there, no, there's a Halloween special. Is there? There's an animated Halloween special. It's okay. okay. I watched it. It's all right. Can you guys hear my cat screaming? Yes. Save the cat. Save the cat. <laughs> but uh, no, you like if look, the last thing I'll say, because I don't want to do spoilers, but I'll say to you guys from a script perspective, Beetlejuice 2 is not the best, but mm. very on point to what we're talking about right now. I think it's a movie that has gone through several hundred drafts. Mm. And it feels like a movie, like two scripts, the one that was about Beetlejuice and one that was using him like this movie uses him. And they smushed those two together and they never reconciled which it is like because gotcha. the first half of the movie is like about Beetlejuice and then the second half of the movie is not. And that's gotcha. where it's at. We we're never going to do that on the show, so I don't mind saying it. But that's my problem with the movie. There's no spoilers in that, so I don't feel bad. But if when you guys eventually watch it, I don't see disagreeing with me. Doesn't mean it. I, I, I enjoyed it. Keaton rules. But <laughs> the script itself, it's like, should we make a movie about Beetlejuice and who he is and where he came from? And then it was like, do the thing that we did before. And they couldn't figure out the sauce. They couldn't bit. figure it out. But everything else is great. Performances and uh, special effects, all that stuff. Keaton, you know. But there you go. There's my Beetlejuice 2 review. <laughs> I love that you were able to put that in. It's well, great. I think it's relevant to what it's Jamie's great. saying. It's totally because right. Because they, they, it almost, when you start watching, you're like, oh no, they're going to make a movie. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like about him. And then it's not. So they, they, you know, they go for the exorcist thing at the end, you know? Uh, I think that's everything, guys. Uh, unless you have anything to add, anything to plug? I got lots of plugs. If go you don't go mind. for it. Plug some stuff. It's, it's Plug City because it's October. Sure. So, um, the biggest deal of my life, of my career. I'm very excited about it. Um, uh, WNF Halloween special, the movie I, these two guys helped make. Jamie uh, helped write the story, and Bob also did some work on it as well. Um, it is on Shutter in seven countries now. So we have a lot of international listeners. So if you have shutter or amc plus has all the shutter titles so it's both amc plus and but it's a shutter exclusive which is like crazy to me um our little 1500 dollars movie uh so check that out and also next week i believe it's next friday uh so the 18th uh fright rags is gonna be this isn't news they 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 kind of talked about it already but fright rags which is like one of the biggest horror merchandise sites uh they're gonna do a line of wnuf halloween special nice. merchandise That's awesome which is insane that's crazy so any listeners of the show there's gonna be a whole bunch of mer there's there's like five different things it's uh it's been a lot of fun uh to be a part of that process and uh very very educational like you it makes you think about writing i've almost i've thought about asking ben the guy in charge fright rags if he would talk to me about doing like an article about how 
uh, screenwriting, what, what merchandise can teach you about screenwriting. Um, Cause a lot of it goes back to like people, places, things that are in the movie that they're like, maybe we should put this on a shirt. And, right. Yeah. yeah. It's like the very things we talk about on this show. So um, anyway, those are two very exciting things that are happening right now in October and involve both of you guys too. So cool. Jamie. Uh, I don't think I have anything to plug. I mean, go watch last night at Terrace Lanes on Tubi or something. And uh, I did have, I think I announced it a couple of weeks ago, but the Save the Cat Beachy workbook does have a digital edition now. So if you're interested in that, you can only buy that at savethecat.com because it is, it's it's very cool. It's kind of like a journal that, that takes you through all these different techniques, many of which we've talked about in the show. And eventually you end up with an outline. So if you're interested in that, go check it out at savethecat.com. Cool. And uh, just so anyone listening was wondering, we did have a little bit of a break, but we're hoping to be back on schedule again. That's right. <laughs> we just had a lot of life stuff happen to all of us. And then, you know, it happens. But we hope, we're hoping to be back on schedule. And thank you for listening. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. 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 Hey, this is Bob Rose, and thank you for listening to Writer's Blockbusters. If you'd like to financially support the show, please consider joining my Patreon. I've been producing the podcast for several years completely out of pocket, and I'd like to keep producing it ad-free and no longer at a loss. If you'd like to help, head on over to patreon.com slash Bob Rose sucks. That's right. Bob Rose sucks. And if you want the one and only Jimmy George to help polish up that writing project you're kind of struggling with, head on over to scriptbutcher.com. As a listener, you already know he's the best there is. Scriptbutcher.com. You can also support the show by simply sharing it or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate both. Thank you for listening and see you next episode.